And now I will introduce today's special guest. Those of you who were here early last month when we last welcomed today's guest speaker to this podium will remember the warm-up he gave our headliner that day. The headliner was Liberal leader Stéphane Dion, and the introduction was a real barn burner. It was a driving, impassioned tribute, not only to the man running for the office of Prime Minister, but to the legacy of the Liberal Party of Canada. Paul Martin is a proud Liberal, both in and out of political office. The title of his memoir, Hell or High Water, My Life in and Out of Politics, says it well. Those of you who have had the pleasure of reading Mr. Martin's book know that he touches on some of the most important events of our time and his. He covers the year, his years as finance minister, the sometimes strained relationship with then Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, and of course, Paul Martin's own term as Prime Minister. He writes honestly and tellingly about the events that were tough, such as the sponsorship scandal, but he also tells us about many of the triumphs, for instance, his groundbreaking work in establishing the G20 Group of Nations, the body that might just be the key to saving world financial markets. And he writes of the passion that infuses his work today, his efforts on behalf of Canada's Aboriginal peoples and the protection of the vital Congo Basin rainforest. And yes, he talks about his friendship with Bono, the lead singer of the rock band U2. Paul Martin's book is a great read, a refreshing introduction to a man of passion and humor. It's also a reminder of what it is to be a true Canadian liberal, committed, hardworking, progressive, and empathetic. The campaign for the leadership of the Liberal Party is now heating up, and Mr. Martin's memoir serves as a reminder to those vying for the right to revive the fortunes of that great party of what it is they are fighting for. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, the former Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honourable Paul Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Members, members of the, the head table, including the one who seems to have gotten more applause than I did, <laughs> sponsors, ladies and gentlemen, the first thing that I want to do uh, before I go in is just to simply tell you uh, that I have a cold. I only tell you this is that because I see that a lot of you have got uh, copies of Hell or High Water on your tables, and I know that in reading it, your own eyes are going to tear up given the huge poetry that's involved in the, in the writing, and so I just simply want to tell you that it is not the poetry of my remarks, but it really is a cold if I have to suddenly sneeze or do whatever one does at this time of the year. I stand before you an author, and I can't believe it. Let me tell you, writing a book is quite an experience. As Helen has said, this one covers a career in business, a second one in government. And finally, what I'd like to refer to as my third career, or as Sheila refers to it, anything that will get you out of the house. <laughs> now, the first thing that I would like to do today, because this seems to be the first question that I normally get, is to tell you why I wrote the book so soon after stepping down from government. And the answer is quite straightforward. When I was Prime Minister, we established a national program of early learning and childcare. We put in place a long-term plan to invest in our cities, in their infrastructure, and in their capacity to draw the talent that will enable us to compete around the globe. And we negotiated the Cologne Accord with the National Chief Phil Fontaine. And we did that so that we could put an end to the shame and the indifference to Aboriginal poverty. I'll talk a little bit about Africa in the course of my remarks, as Helen has said, but I think we all understand that there is, a, there is a third world in Africa, but that there is a third world here in Canada, and that we in Canadians can no longer remain indifferent to the fact that our fellow citizens are not provided the same kind of health care that non-Aboriginals are, that our fellow citizens are not provided the same kind of education that non-Aboriginals are, 
and that the youngest and the fastest growing segment of our population deserves a better deal and that that's what the Kelowna Accord was all about. And I have said that it was one of my greatest regrets that it was not carried forward and it should have been carried forward. Now, in each case, we did all of this in partnership with the provinces and the territories. And all of it was funded within a balanced budget. And yet, when the Conservative government took office, they rejected early learning and child care, the city's agenda, the Kelowna Accord, and they also rejected a proactive foreign policy. And quite simply, I wrote the book because I don't want that agenda to be lost. I, should, I don't believe that government should be a spectator while the world passes us by. And for the same reason, in this, my third, possibly my, my last career, I've undertaken to focus on three issues that are arising out of my political life. Africa, the dilemma facing Canada's original peoples, and the need for a glo new global economic architecture, which is where I'll be spending most of my remarks today. On the African front, I have taken up two roles, one having to do with the creation, the need for an African common market, and the second at the request of the British and Norwegian governments to co-chair a $200 million fund dedicated to protecting the forest of the Congo, the second largest rainforest in the world, and a crucial element in the fight against climate change. Here at home, in terms of Canada's Aboriginal population, working very much with the national chief, my family and I are involved in three projects. One will be the creation of a private sector equity fund to support Aboriginal entrepreneurs. The other two projects are already up and running. Both seek to address the unacceptable high school dropout rates among young Aboriginal Canadians. Both involve mentoring and the teaching of the basics of entrepreneurship, which so many in this room simply grew up understanding. And both projects are now in a number of Ontario high schools, and we intend to introduce them nationally in the not-too-distant future. Now, that being said, I used to tell the students, especially at the Reserve High School up in Thunder Bay, that I look forward to the day when some of them would become Wall Street bankers. Well, given what's going on in the United States, <laughs> I think I'd better come up with a different role model. And that brings me to the final area that I have been spending time on. More time, in fact, than I ever thought I would. And that is the current financial crisis, the need for sound fiscal policy at home, and the need for a new economic architecture globally. For me, it is impossible to follow the events that are now arising out of the subprime crisis without reflecting back on our own fiscal moment of truth as a nation. The indifference and the carelessness that the world is paying for in today's global financial markets were very much on display in Ottawa when I became finance minister in 1993. Debt was soaring at an enormous rate. Deficits were out of control. We were described in the pages of the Wall Street Journal as a third world country. And that's why Don Drummond, who was here, and I and others, launched a frontal attack on the deficit. And believe me, we did not do that to pursue a dream, but to avoid a nightmare. And the result of our effort was a stronger, was a more competitive Canada, and so much so that by the middle of this decade, surplus budgets had become predictable. They were unremarkable. In fact, we were criticized for the surplus budgets. People expected them. But I can still remember putting the final touches on the first federal budget in 35 years not to forecast a deficit. It was a wonderful moment. <laughs> However, now, a little over a decade later, many in government seem to have forgotten what Canadians went through to get to that balanced budget. And I think maybe at some times we should remind them. Because what we did in 1995, the cuts that we made, make no mistake, this was major surgery. And it's not something that as a country we want to go through every 10 years, especially when all that's required to avoid it 
is a commitment to responsible planning and a commitment to exercise discipline. And that's why it was so dismaying that no sooner the recent election over, the current government suddenly discovered, within quotation marks, that the era of deficits was upon, was upon us. And so the old debate begins anew. Of course, we're now told that the cause of the new deficit would be the spending that will be required to stimulate the economy as a result of the financial crisis. And we are going to have to stimulate the economy. Let there be no doubt about it. We made a bargain with the rest of the world, and it's going to be required domestically as well. But don't you believe that the cause of that deficit is the need to stimulate the economy? The predictions of a deficit next year were made by most economists in this country, and it began well before any kind of stimulus was being mooted about, and certainly well before the government would admit it. If we are threatened with a deficit today, it is not because of events beyond the government's control. It is not because of the needed, needed stimulus spending that is being talked about. It is because of a politically inspired tax cut that is costing the country $13 billion annually and because of an unparalleled spending, spending binge without even tar targeted objectives. Il faut comprendre que nous n'avons pas équilibré les budgets et accumulé les excédents budgétaires par pur exercice de forme. Nous l'avons fait parce qu'un pays à petit marché comme le nôtre a besoin d'une marge de manœuvre financière importante pour faire face aux imprévus qui surgissent dans une économie mondiale si interdépendante. It is important to understand that when we were in government, we didn't build up surpluses as some kind of a theoretical exercise. We did it because smaller market countries like Canada, especially countries whose currency is not even considered anywhere near a reserve currency, need the, flexi flexible, the, the fiscal flexibility that will enable them to deal with the unexpected problems that arise in a volatile economy. Let there be no doubt, we are facing a significant global slowdown. The union leaders who are here can talk about it. Canada's leading economist here, who is here is talk, can talk about it. And every single one of you in your own daily lives understand that. We also understand that Canada will not be immune from the turmoil that's going to occur and is occurring outside of our borders. But unfortunately, in today's world, financial crises are the rule. They are not the exception. And governments should prepare for them. As finance minister, I went through five. And there's a reason why they keep on going. It's because essentially we're not putting in place the structures that will allow us to deal with them. But by the way, it wasn't only the budget that we balanced. We put the national pension plan, the Canada pension plan, on a stable footing, and we are one of the very few, if not the only, industrial countries to have put its national pension plan on a stable footing. It is now fuller finance for the next 75 years. And we did this for the same very same reason that we eliminated the deficit. And that is that we didn't think it was fair to ask our children to pay our grocery bills. And we did something else as well. Ten years ago, and there are a number of bankers here today, we tightened up the capital requirements that determine how much our banks can lend. And we st strengthened their loan loss provisions to protect them in the case of an economic downturn. It is no accident that our banks today are the safest and strongest in the world. It is the result of well thought out policy, working with the banks, that resisted the siren call of less regulation that was so prevalent in the 90s. Oh yeah, you can clap. And finally, what is perhaps the most on point, given what is happening in the world today, in today's global marketplace, we also worked to establish better mechanisms. Mechanisms would enable us to deal with what appears to be a never-ending series of cross-border financial shocks, of which subprime is the most recent. And that's what I'd like to focus the rest of my remarks on today, because it is clearly something that is the uppermost in all of our minds. 
1994, when the Mexican peso crisis hit, we had not yet tabled the 95 budget, which led to the elimination of the deficit. And thus, we had not yet shown that the work Canada would clean up its act. Don Drummond can talk about this. We had actually put the budget to bed when the Mexican peso crisis hit. And our dollar was attacked, interest rates went up through the roof. And we were badly sideswiped when the great financial players of the world began to attack our currency relentlessly. And we vowed that that would never happen again. And that's when we decided that it wasn't enough to simply eliminate the deficit. That we had to go beyond deficit reduction that we had to build up the kind of surpluses that would give us as a country the kind of margin to maneuver in the case of a very volatile economy. And thus, two years later, when the Asian crisis hit, Canada had cleaned up its act, and we began, became a leading player in driving to a solution. That solution was to begin the process of reforming the international institutions that are responsible for making globalization work. It was at that time that the G20 finance ministers and central bank governors was formed, and I became its first chairman. The G20, as you know, is made up of the G8 countries, plus the major emerging economies such as China, India, Brazil. And it was formed because it was no longer possible to deal with the ebbs and the flows of the global economy without having all of the world's major players at the table. It was an important step forward, but it was only the beginning of a very important process that still has a very long way to go. The problem, to call it like it is, is that too many institutions that were set up to oversee the world's economy from the IMF to the Financial Stability Forum, from the Basel Committee bank meetings to the G8, appear to be frozen in time. Like dinosaurs in a museum, they are relics of a past age. Today, the world's economies are deeply interconnected as they never have been before. I mean, just take a look. Somebody in California who cannot afford a small house buys a big house with no down payment in 2004. And a few years later, the Asian stock markets are cratering. An investment bank on Wall Street gets careless with its use of derivatives. And a couple of years later, municipalities in northern Norway are facing bankruptcy and Iceland is broke. And even more to the point, Increasingly, our economic fate is being tied together with the emerging economies of the world, China, India, Brazil, and the others. Countries whose voices are rarely heard in the halls of the great international institutions, and that's why it's so urgent that they be reformed. Hank Paulson, for example, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, said only recently that the only replacement for the debt-ridden U.S. consumer as the world's buyer of last resort is a China that stimulates its internal demand and revalues its currency upwards. And the world, a week later, rejoices when China announces a $560 billion stimulus plan. And yet, despite this, China and Brazil, India, don't have a real voice in the meetings that decide the future of the global economy. And I can tell you, having been there half the time, they're not even invited. In short, these nations are plugged into our economies when we need them, but they are not plugged into the institutions that are supposed to make globalization work. Let me put the problem to you a very different way. If the world's financial markets are so seamless that few in the industrial world can, ex can escape the consequences of the collapse of the U.S. housing market, what is going to happen when a similar problem arises in China or India as their economies rival those of the United States, Japan, or Europe. In other words, as the Chinese and the Indian economies increase in breadth and in depth, or indeed the Brazilian and the Russian economies do the same, what's going to happen when a mortgage meltdown occurs in India? What's going to happen when a Chinese investment bank of huge size goes under? What's going to happen when a Brazilian hedge fund or a sovereign wealth fund begin to speculate imprudently? What's going to happen when all of this happens with the same interconnections that we now see given the American subprime? In other words, interconnections that extend far beyond their economies into ours. Now, if that happens, and history says it's going to happen sure as anything,
Will Chinese, the Indian, and the Brazilian investors be the only ones to suffer? I doubt it. I doubt it very much. So the question that we have to deal with now in the midst of this crisis is to begin to wonder about the next one. How far away will the source of the new financial tsunamis from the India, China, and Brazil occur? And who is going to lead the cooperative effort that's required to deal with their international consequences? And the answer to that question does not require a Nobel Prize in economics, because I'm going to give it. So <laughs> what it does require is a level of international dialogue and cooperation that does not exist today. If anyone has any doubt about the lack of cooperation that exists among the sovereign nations of the world, I'd only ask you to go back a couple of months ago and take a look at the stumbling about the beggar thy neighbor policies that was pursued by the various European countries and their banks in the early days of the subprime crisis to see what I mean. When Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, stepped in and essentially brought forth the plan that I think is probably the best thing that we've ever seen, he did it after the Irish banks had proceeded to take action that was going to beggar every other bank in Europe unless they moved. Now think about what would happen in a world where China, India, or Brazil was in trouble and took those kinds of actions at a time when they represented a huge part of the global economy. So why is a dialogue so necessary? I'll tell you why. All of the experts say that better regulation, better transparency are necessary to prevent financial crises, and I believe that. In fact, Canada is a classic example of what sound regulation can do. But it's utopian to think that that's sufficient. The fact is it's almost impossible for regulators to keep up with the ambition, to keep up with the greed of the market. But regulators sitting there where they are cannot keep up with the innovation and the financial imagination that exists within the market system. For this reason, there has to be a forum. There has to be a forum where regulators, central bankers, finance officials from all of the major economies can talk about what's going on out there, can exchange information, and can move far quicker than any regulation would ever allow you to do. Now, the good news is there is such a forum. It's called the Financial Stability Forum. The bad news is that 10 years ago when it was created, some of us made the suggestion that the emerging economies of China, India, and Brazil be part of it. And that was rejected. Thankfully, it now appears, because it's become so gross, that 10 years later, the emerging economies are going to be part of it. But the basic problem remains, and anybody who has had to deal with this world understands it, that the world has changed, but the Eurocentric and Americocentric view of the most governments has not. The fact is that now that capital markets are truly seamless the world over, now that the global economy is on the way to having not one or two, <coughs> excuse me, but not one or two, but five or six major mega economies, we have to change our understanding and our definition of risk, and we have to change our institutions to reflect that risk. In that vein, despite the fears of those who worry about international coordination on sovereignty, which is what we now hear all the time, you can't operate at the global level. I'm not talking about supranational organizations. I'm just talking about making organizations like the IMF work. All we hear about, oh my gosh, you can't do that because that's going to be a reflection on national sovereignty. Well, let me tell you, the global governance does not mean global government. Quite the opposite. What global governance is, is the reaffirmation of national sovereignty in that it allows national governments to solve problems that surpass national borders. Our sovereignty as a country in Canada has been affected by the lax banking practices of other countries. And that's what's going to happen is with the Chinese and the Indians do not, if they continue to reflect what they see as opposed to what we say, the same thing is going to happen. So there's got to be a better definition of national sovereignty. It's one that says the national government of this country can protect this country by working with others. The problem is the international architecture that's developed following the Second World War is failing us. All of the institutions that have been set up to deal with the gaps have been frozen in time for too long. A time when the G7 countries dominated the world, Brazil, Africa, Brazil, India, China, were but specks on the economic horizon. Since stepping down from government, 
I've continued to advocate for G20 meetings, the finance minister's meetings at the leader's level. I've done it in Europe, the U.S., and China, as have three major Canadian think tanks, the Centre for International Governance and Innovation, the Centre for Global Studies, and the G8 Research Group at U of T. The G20 is a major Canadian initiative. And why is it so important? It's so important because the GS, the G8, is less important. When it was originally formed, it was the major body. It was the major economic powers of the world. Well, they aren't any longer. Clearly, you can no longer ignore the emerging economies. And indeed, for those of you who followed what happened to the G20 in Washington, their influence was significant. And they did more with three weeks preparation, in my opinion, most G8 meetings, including the ones that I went to, did with a, with a year's preparation. And nor are there problems, only ones that are limited to the financial, to the financial world. Financial shocks, the G20 should deal with. But also energy security, climate change, the Doha round, the threat of pandemics, my cold. The, <laughs> But these are all issues that surpass the capacity of the G8 to deal with them. And so if the G8 is going to play the world that it's going to, it's going to have to be reformed and become the G20. Now the current Canadian government has said on at least two occasions that reform of the G8 or a G20 at the leader's level is not of any interest to it. But having now attended the G20 meeting in Washington, I hope that Mr. Harper will change his mind. Even more to the point, I hope for Canada's sake that he will become a very strong and vocal advocate for the G20. Because this is not an issue where we can afford Canada's voice abroad to be silent or our government to be a passive spectator. We're a wealthy country, but much of our wealth depends on a smoothly functioning international market and on a global system that works and a representative G8 now G20 Steering Committee, will be the key. And there are other reasons as well why, despite its reluctance, the Canadian government should take the lead in the furtherance of the G20's mandate. The first arises out of the fact that in two years, two years from now, Canada hosts the G8. And in the last number of years, the countries that have hosted the G8 have not done well. And the problem stems from the fact that certain countries believe that the so-called outreach formula of the G8 is a viable alternative to reform. The outreach formula is one where the five countries, China, India, uh, Japan, South Africa, and Mexico, are invited for lunch at a summit. And then they're dismissed while the rest of us continue their meetings. At both the Sea Island Summit in Georgia and the Glen Eagle Summit in Scotland, I objected to this and pointed out that the absurdity of inviting major powers for only part of a summit, in effect saying, cool your heels out in the corridor until we, the great nations of the world, invite you in, was simply absurd. Many of the G8 leaders agreed with me, but unfortunately, the same procedure was followed at the next summit in Germany and the last year's summit in Japan. The out what's the, what's the consequence? Well, it's predictable. The Outreach Five became the G5. And the G5 have become increasingly frustrated and vocal about the arrogance of the G8. I simply ask you to picture this. We meet at 9 o'clock in the morning. Let's say in Scotland. We did the same thing in Georgia. 9 o'clock in the morning. Hu Xintao, the President of China, Mohammed Singh, the Prime Minister of India and the other three are invited to the meeting. We meet at 9 o'clock, they're called in at noon. We have lunch and then we say goodbye because we've got important things to deal with. What do you think is going on outside in the corridor? We say we don't want to have a G5, heaven forbid, we don't want to have two adversarial groups. So I simply pointed out what the hell do you think they're doing out there in the corridor if they're not talking? You know, and they, somebody then said, I can't believe it, it wasn't, one of the, it wasn't one of the leaders said, well, yeah, but they don't speak to each other. I said, we've got translators. It's the <laughs> but this is the issue. 
And if you take a look at what they have now said, take a look at what Lula from, 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 from Brazil said two weeks ago. Take a look at what the Prime Minister of India said in the plane on the way back. The reason that the Doha round failed and the reason that it may have been picked, picked up to be fixed at the G20 meeting is that in fact they said they are not going to deal any longer with the G8 in the position of beggarship. That's what this is all about and that's why this is so important. For this reason, Canada has to act because in two years we host the G8 and that is an opportunity that is not to be lost. But if it is, if we lose that opportunity, let me tell you that the cost to Canada and to our reputation as a leader in the push for greater cooperation will be far greater than any of us can imagine. The second reason that Canada must show greater leadership is that after the Washington meeting, quite simply, there is no turning back. Whether the alternative is the G20 or another, reform is inevitable. And let us not kid ourselves, there are other options to the G20. For instance, some are already talking about a G6 or a G7, consisting of the USA, Japan, Russia, China, India, Europe, and a Muslim state. This would be the G20, but in a different configuration, and as you will know, Canada would not be part of it. In other words, reform is inevitable. But we had better be leading that reform, for we are not one of the world's biggest economies, and there is no guarantee otherwise that we will be part of the final result. Well, time passes on, and I should draw these remarks to a close. So let me just say in summary that today's world requires a level of international coordination that is fundamentally different than any other period in our history. Quite simply, the structures that will oversee the 21st century have been delayed too long. Il nous reste très peu de temps pour mettre en place le genre de tribune qui permettra de repartir les pouvoirs entre les mega économies du 21e siècle. We only have a very short period of time to put in place the kinds of institutions that are going to allow power to be shared between the great economies of the 21st century. And the longer we wait, the more set in their ways others will become. And the more difficult, the more elusive, sound global governance will become. In short, acting now on the reform of the world's great multilateral institutions is very much in Canada's interests. And so, by the way, is taking the lead in Canada, in Africa, in Canada's interest. And so is facing up to the tragedy that our Aboriginal legacy has left so many Canadians, which only we can solve. And so is ensuring our financial strength in Canada's legacy. And anyway, that's my agenda. I hope it's yours. I also hope you'll read the book. Thank you very much. to remind everyone that uh, Prime Minister Martin will take questions, so if you have them, uh, please flag the attention of uh, Jennifer, who has a microphone and will... <laughs> uh, Mr. Martin, you can retake the... Uh... Mr. Martin, I wanted to ask you, uh, we, every country is considering some form of fiscal stimulus. We see now that the UK is choosing to lower its sales tax. What is the best form of fiscal stimulus in Canada? Uh, what, did, what did you say about the sales tax? <laughs> it was 17.5%. They've lowered their VAT to 15.5%. Yeah. You'll notice, I think it's really important. The reason I asked uh, Amanda to, to, to um, clarify the question, my understanding is what they have done in the, in the United Kingdom is that they, they are going to, they're going to reduce it, but they're going to reduce it for a set period of time. And it's very, very important. What they're saying essentially is it's going back up by now. Um, 
and uh, which is a very great difference between what has happened here. Well, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the infrastructure is by far the, the best stimulus. Um, the, 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 there are a number of important reasons in any stimulus package. One of them is that that stimulus package has got to be able to, to create jobs. Number two, it ha they have to be ready to go. Enough, I, my understanding is that most of the municipalities across this country have got infrastructure packages that have got the, the environmental um, uh, have got the environmental approvals already, and they're just waiting to go. And in fact, my understanding is as well, the government has the money to do it. And so I think that's clearly the first place that they should go. My question is, how can we encourage more women and diverse population to public life? How can, how can we encourage? How can we encourage more women and the first population to public life? Well, I, I, I'm going to tell you this is obviously, a, you know, a subject that has certainly concerned me and a number of the other political figures who were here um, in, in the room. I think that the single most important thing is that Parliament's got to change. I don't know how many of you watch Question Period, um, but. I, let, me just say, let me just simply tell you, and I, I'm sure that there are a number of political figures here in the room. I cannot tell you the number of times when I was in, when, when I was in government and I would be asked a, you know, basically a highly partisan, absolutely outrageous question. And I would answer um, with a, 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 I would answer in kind. And I would walk out of there, you know, with a house of all of the members of parliament sharing and saying, boy, you really stuck it to them. And I would go back to my riding and I would go into a senior citizen's residence and they would look at me as if I was some kind of a hyena. And they, you know, and they basically say, what are you doing? You know, what, what is this? this? This is what, this is governing what the country is all about. So I think part of it is I think that the whole, I think the political process has got to change. That, that, that and it isn't simply a question of saying it's easy to go to civility. People have got to be seeing that it works. Most, there are, you take a look, there are all kinds of women who run municipal politics. There are all kinds of, of, of women who are involved in NGOs and all kinds of activity around the world. In fact, the leaders of most of our NGOs are women. And I, I've talked to so many women to try to get them to run. Um, and inevitably, it really comes down to... Um, look, I'm not running to get my name in the paper, to get my name in the headlines. I want to run because I want to do something, and I can do something better somewhere else. And I think we're going to have to change that process if we're going to get more women. As a former Prime Minister who supported the development and passage of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, what can you do to... Um, assist efforts to ensure its full implementation in Canada, given that Canada wasn't one of the signatories? I, I, you know, I, I, maybe it's just, maybe it's my ears are plugged or, as Sheila says, I never listen, but I, I'm having, <laughs> I just a little trouble. Could you just tell me? Okay. Um, as a former Prime Minister who yeah. subor uh, supported the passage and development of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, what can you do to assist efforts to ensure its full implement implementation in Canada, given that Canada wasn't one of the signatories? But just for those of you who, who don't know, the, the resolution uh, that is being referred to is a resolution that has been in the negotiation stage for some 20 years. It is a, it's, and Canada was one of the leaders um, in the initiative. And what it essentially says is uh, that the indigenous people um, around the world are essentially where the bulk of poverty lies and the bulk of discrimination. And this is really true. This is, it, this is not only Canada. It is in, and it's not only Australia, but it is in Africa. The indigenous people of Africa, the Bushmen, and the sand, as an example, and the sand, as an example, are not treated fairly um, by the much larger Bantu populations. And, and, and the Africans understand that and they accept it. And what happened is that Canada took the lead on this. And um, when the change of government occurred, uh, the fact is that, that Canada suddenly joined the United States. Um, and, and, and Australia, the then Australian government, in saying we don't want to see it pass. And, but it passed anyway. And the fundamental issue here is that Canada's indigenous people have taken the lead around the world on issues such as this. When I went down to, when I was last down at the Western Hemisphere Conference in, in, uh, in, uh, in Argentina, the one that you saw Stephen Harper at the other day, the the Assembly of First Nations sent a delegation down, and it was a Canadian delegation working with 
the, the indigenous populations of South America that actually brought the, this to the fore. And here's an area of Canada taking tremendous leadership, not leadership necessarily by the Canadian government, but, but by an important segment of the Canadian population. We turned our back on it. So the only thing that we can do is we'll have to continue just arguing this way until such time as the government either changed its mind or it's changed for it. That's pretty subtle. The, um... Mr. Martin, we have time for one more question. Okay. Mr. Martin, under what circumstances in the current environment would you advocate uh, budget deficits being incurred by the government? The, the world's leaders at the G20 um, agreed that there was going to have to be stimulus. Um, they recommended anywhere from 1 to 2 percent of uh, gross domestic product. Uh, or there are other formulas that have been out there. Um, there is no doubt that in the kind of world in which we live, uh, this is going to require massive coordination. And it is not countries are going to have to come to the fore. Um, countries that are in less, uh, better financial shape than we are in. So stimulus that is long term, not stimulus that is going to give a long-term benefit, stimulus that is going to recognize that what we're doing is we're taking money from our children in order to do it, and therefore there's got to be a benefit for our children, obviously would make, would make sense. My problem in this particular debate is not there. My problem in this particular debate is that, is that this crisis, not this particular crisis, but that a crisis would occur now is not unexpected. We had five in my time. That was one every three and a half years. We knew there was going to be another, cr another crisis. And I can tell you after this one, there's going to be another one. And that's the nature of being an independent global economy, and it's the nature of the cycles of the market system. So what we can do is we can mitigate them. But if you're a government, surely to heaven, you should prepare for the unexpected if the unexpected is to be expected. And then that's what they didn't do. We built up a margin of maneuver. We understood that, with those, that those surpluses were going to be passed on and lower debt or infrastructure or other things. But we understood that sooner or later, a crisis was going to hit. The Mexican crisis that I talked about, Don Drummond will tell you, we had the budget put to bed and we had to go back. So we put in prudence, we put in contingency reserves, and we laid it all out. We didn't hide it from anybody. My problem is, that the, is what the current government did is it, gut, it gutted that margin of maneuver. It destroyed it. And it destroyed it in good times so that it wasn't there in bad times. And so, all, my, my objection is this. Don't say that you're going into deficit before, a, don't say you're going into deficit because, because of deficit spending. When every economist in the country says you're going into deficit because what you did do was mismanage the economy. That's my issue with this. I'm not... I'm, I'm, I've just been told by the, the president that that is it. Um, <laughs> this is pretty fun. Um, <laughs> but let, let me just say, I'm very grateful to all of you for being here today. I, it really means an awful lot to me, and it means a lot to Sheila, and I, I really do appreciate it. And, and I, for heaven's sakes, don't leave a book on the table. Take a book. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to call on Alan Odette, past president of the Canadian Club, to formally thank Mr. Martin. I need a little step stool here. I need a little step stool. Thank you very much to the Right Honourable Paul Martin uh, for joining us today. Thank you as well to the Kuchiching Institute of Public Affairs, the Canadian Club's partner in this lunch this afternoon. And thank you all, of course, for coming. Henry David Thoreau once wrote that we do not learn much from learned books, but from true, sincere human books, from frank and honest biographies. Pick up Paul Martin's memoir, open it to any page, and you'll find a reflection of the man, true, sincere, human, frank, and honest. You may be astonished by the depth of feeling contained in these pages. You may not 
quite expect the level of insight, self-deprecation, and sense of humor which which he tells his story. But if you know Paul Martin, you won't be surprised by the passion expressed for doing the hard work we all should do on behalf of our fellow citizens. You'll understand his empathy for all the people of this great country, because Paul Martin, you truly are a great Canadian. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Alan. Thank you again, Mr. Martin, and thank you all for joining us here today. This concludes our television programming, which will be broadcast on Rogers TV. This meeting is now adjourned.